Okay, this video is chapter 13b. So we're talking about diabetes from the book, The Medical Reformation. Here's the book, and Vegan Renaissance. Um, this is a long chapter. That's why we're uh, splitting it into 13a, b, and c. So this is sort of my Martin Luther, you know, vegan monk uh, outfit here. All right, so this is where we left off. We talked about... Um, You know, mitochondria is where we are working on. If you get hypoxic, there's lack of oxygen, you can convert the pyruvate at the end of glycolysis into lactate. Um, and you can even run, there's other pathways. We're not going to get into all this biochemistry. I like the pictures. You know, all you're going to remember anyways is the picture. Glucose comes into a cell. Hexokinase is an enzyme that will phosphorylate it, put a phosphate on the glucose. That makes a charge. It traps it in the cell so it can't get out of the cell. It'll run through the glycolysis reactions, typically in our context for what we're interested in. Gets made into pyruvate, gets sent into Krebs cycle. It actually has a decarboxylated and make it into acetyl group, two carbons. And it runs through Krebs cycle. Electron carriers go to the inner mitochondrial membrane and they're used for electron transport. I'm going to show this at multiple layers, so don't, don't be overwhelmed. This is going to be pretty easy once I, once I go through the different layers of it. Okay. Uh, the key result out of Krebs cycle is you make electron carriers called NADH and FADH2. And <clears throat> they're going to send electrons to the inner mitochondrial membrane. Okay, here is the inner mitochondrial membrane. And this is, you know, how where life on Earth comes from. So basically, these are electron carriers, you know, one, two, three, four. This right here is ATP synthase. It's going to make ATP, adenosine triphosphate. And with carriers one, two, three, four, you're basically handing off electrons like a fireman bucket brigade. And it's also a little bit like a snowball rolling down a hill towards progressively more aggressive, stronger electron grabbers. Oxygen is the ultimate electron acceptor, and it's a very strong uh, grabber of electrons. That means it has a high electronegativity. It really wants to grab electrons. Okay. The energy acquired by letting this snowball roll down a hill, so to speak, you know, sending the electron, passing along to the more aggressive grabber of it, the molecule like oxygen with a higher affinity for the electrons, generates energy that's used to pump protons, H plus is a proton, into the intramembranous space. The intramembranous space is the space here between the outer mitochondrial membrane, OMM, and this right here is the inner mitochondrial membrane, IMM. And so when you pump all these protons into the space, they, they're, they're pumped in under pressure, so to speak. And you can harvest that gradient of a high proton concentration by letting a proton come back into the mitochondria through the ATP synthase. And the energy of that process allowing it to come, it's almost like pressurized air. So allowing that proton to come back in, which it really wants to do, can be used to spin this ATP synthase and add a phosphate to ADP, adenosine diphosphate, as in two phosphates, to make adenosine triphosphate, as in three phosphates. Okay, and that's the energy of life right here, ATP. This is where most of it is made in the inner mitochondrial membrane. Uh, here's coenzyme Q traveling in the inner mitochondrial membrane. Occasionally, an electron will fall off a of coenzyme Q. It's called electron leak, and it can combine with an oxygen within the mitochondrial matrix to form a superoxide. Okay, now these are usually neutralized pretty quickly by superoxide dismutase. Okay, but sometimes this can be excessive, and we're going to talk about that in just a little bit. Hmm. Oh, the inner mitochondrial membrane gradient is extraordinarily high. It's like negative 160 millivolts. So that's, that's about the highest gradient that I'm aware of in the human body. You know, if you look at neurons, you know, your brain cell plasma membrane gradient, that's about negative 65, negative 70 millivolts. This is negative 160 millivolts. That's incredibly powerful. These are like a coal-burning electric plant, you know, inside our cells. They're really powerful. Here's a little bit about electronegativities. So the molecule 
that has the highest electronegativity out of everything in the periodic table of elements is fluorine or fluoride. It's got 3.98, super high. And fluorine, it just wants to grab electrons, which is characteristic of pathogens. It's, it's super toxic. It really shouldn't be in our drinking water. That's insane to have it in our drinking water, but that's a topic of a different lecture. Um, and then the thing that's next to it, the next most powerful grabber of electrons is oxygen. And so that's just a reminder that oxygen is the ultimate electron acceptor in the electron transport process of the inner mitochondrial membrane. It's a very characteristic feature of oxygen. It wants to grab electrons. Fluoride is a poison. It's used as a rat poison and to poison other things. It really, really, really should not be in one's drinking water. You want to filter it out or move to a different area rather than drink that stuff. Okay, here's the electron transport chain. And this is just showing that you will take the protons and you're pumping the protons into the intermitochondrial space, the intramembranous space. And then you're passing the electrons. This is like from a metabolized molecule of glucose. You're passing them down to progressively more aggressive electron grabbers until finally they get to oxygen and it's converted into H2O, into water. Okay, and then here's the, the proton coming backwards through ATP synthase. And that will make it spin and it couples adding a phosphate to ADP to make ATP. So I'm just showing the same thing in this new way, new picture, just to you know, get more familiar with it. So in a sense, what the cell really do, does is it split the hydrogen atom. It split the hydrogen atom into its proton, H+, and into its electron, E negative. Okay. Um, the hydrogen atom is split into an electron that's carried by the NADH or FADH2, and then the protons are pumped into the intermembranous space. So that's a good way to think of it, splitting the, the hydrogen atom into its proton and its electron, and then using them to generate energy. And that's most of the energy generated in the human body. This image here just shows a little more detail. It shows that... Um, you know, part of the process, you know, superoxide dismutase will neutralize the superoxide anion to hydrogen peroxide, H2O2. And then uh, catalase or glutathione peroxidase will then convert it to H2O. However, in the, pres in the presence of iron overload, if you've got a, H a lot of H2O2, sometimes it will undergo a different reaction. Like if there's iron overload, you can run something called the Fenton reaction. It can lead to production of hydroxyl radicals, which are quite toxic to the inner mitochondrial membrane because they can do something called undergo lipid peroxidation, and that can severely damage the inner mitochondrial membrane. So that's another reason why you don't want to be iron overloaded because it increases your risk of generating these types of lipid peroxidation reactions that will trash your mitochondria. Superoxide anion is a free radical because it has an unpaired electron in its outer orbital. And it's also called a reactive oxygen species. It's sort of a more you know, convenient name for it. <sighs> okay, let's see. Um, all right, so another slide just sort of reminding us of the steps of fat in diabetes. First of all, you accumulate fat within your skeletal muscle, also called intramyocellular lipid, sometimes abbreviated IMCL, and that causes insulin resistance in the skeletal muscle after eating. So that's postprandial hyperglycemia, postprandial insulin resistance. Over time, with more and more high-fat diets, more and more fat accumulates in the liver, and you get fatty liver, and then that's like saying diabetes of the liver. The liver becomes less able to sense blood glucose levels, and it'll tend to keep pushing more glucose into the blood even when it shouldn't be, and then you'll end up with fasting hyperglycemia. Um, and then eventually, this hyperlipidemia will lead to excessive lipid being laid down in the pancreas, and you'll get all these additional subsequent secondary complications. The excess of fat laid down in the pancreas will damage the pancreatic beta cells, and once they lose their ability to make insulin, the person becomes fully insulin dependent. But again, the key point is that it's all this fat is the main problem in diabetes, excessive dietary fat intake.
Okay, here's showing the effect of fat on the uh, intermitochondrial membrane, especially saturated fat. It'll inhibit at the level of you know coenzyme Q and complex three. And when there's large amounts of fat and they get into the, the mitochondrial matrix, it'll the mitochondria will sense something we call overnutrition, and it'll shut down the electron transport, and things will start to back up, and there'll be a lot of secondary problems from that. So the cell is overwhelmed with the excessive amount of fat. The fat gets into the skeletal muscle mitochondria faster than does the glucose, and so then it doesn't want any more nutrients coming in. It's overwhelmed already by the excessive amounts of fat. Okay, so here's a picture of how insulin is supposed to work. So normally when a person eats a meal uh, with some glucose uh, getting into the blood, Insulin then is released from the pancreas. It'll bind to the insulin receptor on the skeletal muscle plasma membrane. The plasma membrane is the outer membrane of the skeletal muscle cell. And upon binding to insulin, it'll send a message through you know, additional mediators, which then tell these glucose type 4 transporters. They're sitting around in a vesicle within the cytoplasm to travel up to the plasma membrane, merge with the plasma membrane, and then these glucose type 4 transporters will basically form a hole through which glucose can enter into the skeletal muscle. And so that's what's normally supposed to happen. Blood glucose goes up, insulin goes up, insulin binds to the receptor, insulin receptor on the skeletal muscle, and it signals for the cytoplasmic GLUT4 transporters to come up to the plasma membrane, merge with it, and they will then allow glucose into the cell. That's what normally should happen. Okay, but here's what happens when you have insulin resistance. When you get excess amount of uh, dietary fat, with the meal, it'll get into the skeletal muscle before uh, the glucose gets there, and it'll uh, cause the cell to sense what is called overnutrition, like from the backing up of mitochondrial electron transport, and it sends a signal to not let these glucose type 4 transporters go to the plasma membrane. What the cell is, in a sense, saying is we have too much nutrients here, too much, we're too overwhelmed with all the fat. Uh, coming in from the dietary fat that we cannot deal with glucose right now. So it'll prevent the glucose from, the glucose can't get into the cell without the glucose type 4 transporters. So uh, because of that, they'll just stay in the blood and you'll have hyperglycemia in the blood. So this is postprandial hyperglycemia. And I got a lot more detailed videos about this at my YouTube channel and I've made lectures about diabetes at other channels. Uh, like there's some at the Chef AJ channel, there's some at the Be Green with Amy channel. Okay, so here's another thing that happens. This is the concept of carbohydrate tolerance. So basically, if you eat fat first, then what happens is it'll cause insulin resistance. And then if you subsequently eat carbohydrates, you get a much bigger spike in blood glucose level because the earlier fats had induced uh, insulin resistance. Versus if you just eat the starch alone, the carbohydrates alone, with no earlier previous fat, your blood glucose level will not go so high postprandial because you, you'll have better carbohydrate tolerance. So the point was the excessive dietary fat eaten earlier causing insulin resistance led to reduced carbohydrate tolerance. Okay, here's another point. And this is actually one of the most important points. And this is one you might want to hit the print screen button on. Here, let me get my picture out of the way. So this study showed that they were trying to test how does fat get into skeletal muscle and what they found was it was getting into the skeletal muscle by traveling across the plasma membrane itself. You know they initially thought it was going to largely go through CD36 that's a fatty acid transporter and what it was turning out was the fatty acid was intercalating itself into the outer leaflet of the plasma membrane like it could take on a proton and then become neutral and that'll facilitate it intercalating into the outer leaflet of the plasma membrane of a skeletal muscle cell and then it could flip-flop into the inner um, the inner leaflet of the plasma membrane and then from there get into the cell so that's a way that fatty acid can get in the cell and the problem with this is it happens in a concentration gradient dependent fashion meaning the more fat there is in the blood the more of it that gets into the skeletal muscle especially saturated fat and this is different than glucose. Remember, glucose was tightly regulated by, you know, binding of insulin to the insulin receptor and subsequent movement of the glucose type 4 uh, transporters up to the plasma memory. But fat intake is not well regulated. That's why you don't want to be eating a lot of dietary fat because you can't really control the rate at which it enters the skeletal muscle uh, 
and it can cause a lot of problems like diabetes. So that, that was the whole point, and that's called the flip-flop mechanism whereby it intercalates into the outer leaflet, then it flips into the inner leaflet, then goes into the cytoplasm, the flip-flop maneuver. And it's a big deal that it can get into cells without a transporter. That also makes it harder to inhibit this. There's not a specific transporter to make a medication to to inhibit. And it was the rate was just due to the concentration of fatty acids outside the cell. So the best way to reduce fat getting into your skeletal muscle cells is to eat less fat. And this is another reason why the low-fat diet is the best diet for humans. Okay, and populations that eat high-fat diets, they have a lot of health problems like the Eskimos and the Maasai. People think the Maasai are, are real healthy. They're not. You know, they exercise a tremendous amount to compensate for their high-fat diets, but they still end up with lots of atherosclerosis, and that's been shown by autopsy studies. Um, and it's been known for a long time, too, that dietary fat induces insulin resistance. And, you know, there's a J. Shirley Sweeney study back in the 1920s. I think it was in 1927. And that was followed up by many researchers like in the early days, Hemsworth and Rabinowitz, but later on, Kempner, Pritikin, and McDougall. They all showed that low-fat diets get much better results with diabetic patients. And then the best paper ever written about diabetes was one written by this guy right here, Michael Brownlee. He's a genius. It's like a, that paper is a total AO, academic orgasm. It's so brilliant. It's so beautiful. Uh, I almost wanted to cry when I read that paper. I'm like, wow, it's just so great. Um, he won the 2004, Michael Brownlee won the 2004 Banting Award as the best diabetes researcher in the world. The name of the paper is called The Pathobiology of Diabetic Complications, A Unifying Mechanism. And it was published in the Diabetes Journal of 2005. Uh, you can get the paper, though, if you go to the, like, Diabetes uh, ADA, American Diabetes Association. Even if you're willing to sign in and give them your email, you can watch his lecture of it. Um, if you try to just get the PubMed uh, citation, it'll just say no abstract available. And you know, that's often the case, you know, partly because it has a little bit of an essay-like en entry uh, but it's also the case, you know, Big Pharma doesn't want the pros to see this sort of thing. So here it is, Pathobiology of Diabetic Complications and um, a Unifying Mechanism. And like I said here, you go to the American Diabetes Association and you will get, you'll be able to read the entire paper. It's worth it to print that one out. If you want to understand diabetes, this paper is magnificent. Like I said, it's the best paper ever written on diabetes. It's beautiful. Okay, we talked about uh, excessive uh, fat, especially sad fat, inhibiting electron transport. Um, and Brownlee is the one who figured out a lot of this stuff. He tested it and retested it and confirmed it in a bunch of different ways. Okay. Uh, when excessive electrons are fed too rapidly into electron transport chain, then excessive protons are pumped into the intermembranous space. The voltage goes too high, and it starts to reverse at that point, and it also starts to leak electrons at that point and you generate more and more superoxides, and you can potentially overwhelm the neutralization system of superoxide dismutase. Okay, so this is just a repeat of what we showed earlier, the idea of you start leaking electrons, and they'll leak onto oxygen sitting in the mitochondrial matrix. That gets converted into superoxide, the reactive oxygen species or free radical. And up to a point, you can neutralize it pretty well with superoxide dismutase. But if you make just too many of them, it'll start going to other locations and causing damage, including DNA damage. And when it damages DNA, it activates something called a PARP enzyme. We're going to come back to this PARP enzyme a little later. And by the way, this PARP enzyme, it will um, inhibit the glycolysis enzyme 3-PGA-DH, that's 3-phosphoglyceraldehyde dehydrogenase. And when it inhibits that, that means glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate or 3-PGA 3-phosphoglyceraldehyde will accumulate, and that sets off a whole bunch of reactions that are really bad for the cell you don't want happening. It activates something called protein kinase C, that, that's bad and associated with insulin resistance. It then also gets converted in part to MGO, methylglyoxal, and that then forms advanced glycation end products, does a lot of tissue damage. Okay, I think we're going to leave it right here at this point on methylglyoxal, methylglyoxal being formed because the, the sequence of reactions
following uh, inhibition of electron transport led to DNA damage, activation of the DNA repair enzyme PARP, and the PARP is also then uh, inhibiting glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase, or 3-PGA dehydrogenase, same thing. And that leads to accumulation of MgO, methyl glyoxal. So I'll talk about this in the next lecture. Um, hope this was helpful. Thank you.